All right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone, for, for joining. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm very pleased to introduce you to Dan Carney, who's uh, coming to us from, from Berkeley. Um, so Dan is, uh, I guess, I, you're, you're a theorist, right? You're some, somewhere in between like theory, theory and experiment. I think you are nominally a, a theorist. <laughs> Um, but I you're definitely doing, here. yeah. Dan is doing some some very interesting stuff to do with um, basically quantum limits of, of measurement and and how they apply to to various types of searches for fundamental physics. So yeah, this is a really interesting topic. And Dan, I'll uh, leave it in your hands. Uh, yeah, thanks a lot for um, asking me to do the talk, and it's nice to not have to get on a plane. <laughs> um, so I, you know, Kieran told me that this is a kind of a, a mixed audience. So I, I kind of have a grab bag of things that I want to talk about. But the, the title, I mean, should run through. So I'm really talking about what can you um, learn about fundamental physics, meaning new particles and gravity, uh, you know, with with measurements that are currently being made sort of in the regime where the measurement is limited by quantum effects. So so a sort of set of punchlines, and I'll try to reinforce these as we go, are um, you know, the act of measurement in quantum mechanics imposes noise. So, you know, measurements are random in quantum mechanics, and that simple fact means that there's just some baseline level of noise uh, when you measure things. Um, it That noise is getting more and more important in a wide variety of contexts, particle physics and otherwise, um, you know, quantum computing, for example. Uh, it's only going to keep showing up. However, a somewhat maybe less appreciated fact is you can engineer quantum noise. So it's like other noise sources, you can try to get rid of it by by various tricks. Um, and so this sort of last thing is, is a, a piece of, you know, something very, very active in many fields, including uh, particle physics these days. So I want to start with an example that I just really love this example. I'm not involved personally. Um, I, I, you know, hopefully people have part of this idea of Ptolemy. So Ptolemy is a proposal to, uh, it's actually an effort, a real experimental effort to look for relic cosmic neutrinos um, using the only way anybody's really thought to make this work. So this is an idea to the Steve Weinberg from uh, 60 years ago now. Um, if, if you don't know the idea, the idea is basically if to have to look at tritium. So, so tritium undergoes beta decay. Uh, the beta decay spectrum is shown on this graph on the right. So this is a on the x-axis is the energy of the it's the energy of the ejected um, electron, the beta electron, uh, as, a, as and the rate on the y-axis. So in normal beta decay, you have tritium uh, decays to a helium, an electron, and a neutrino, and the electron has some spectrum. So Ptolemy, the idea was, um, or the idea is. Uh, how do I detect a relic neutrino? Well, the relic neutrino has almost no kinetic energy. It's it's basically, it's very slow. It has very little mass. It's just this lame thing that never interacts with anything. So so Weinberg pointed out that um, instead of trying to detect its, say, elastic scattering off of something, you could look for it by having it invert, trigger an inverse beta decay. So the, the neutrino gets absorbed by the tritium, which then triggers inverse beta decay, where I just have a daughter of helium and an electron. Uh, and the idea was that in those events, because I've added the neutrino mass uh, to the initial state, the final state electron can have a little bit more energy, and in particular, it can have the neutrino's mass worth of energy. So, so that's what this green bump is on the histogram on the right. Um, it's the the events where, where a relic neutrino is captured, and you get a slightly more energetic electron. So the splitting you see is about 100 Mega electron volts, which is roughly the expected mass of the neutrino. Um, and what you have to do is then make a bunch of tritium. You have to put it somewhere. So the proposal was to put it on graphene. Uh, and then you have to detect very precisely these electrons um, coming out of these events. In particular, you have to resolve the energy of this electron uh, to a precision, you know, such that you can distinguish these green events from these red events. So a lot of work was going into this. Um, and then a couple of years ago, it was observed that this isn't possible. And it's not possible for uh, elementary quantum mechanical reasons. So the tritium is, in this example, bound to the graphene. It's bound just chemically. So there's some binding potential shown here along, along the z-axis, um, which has a width. And the width is going to be sort of order angstroms. It's chemical energies. So the tritium, uh, just its center of mass, uh, is in a 
ground state wave function, which is some Gaussian sitting in this potential here. And so its width, its, its, its position uncertainty is about an angstrom. And just by Heisenberg uncertainty, that means its momentum is uncertain to about a kilo EV. So if you work that through, the initial uncertainty in the tritium uh, momentum means that there's some induced final state uncertainty in the electron momentum or its energy. And if you put in the numbers, you know, KEV squared divided by an MeV, basically, you find that the, the resulting uh, uncertainty in the electron energy is about an electron volt, which is an order of magnitude too large um, to resolve the shift you needed to see. So in other words, it'll blur out these two peaks and they'll start overlapping and you just can't tell whether you got an electron from a normal beta emission or an inverse beta from a, a neutrino absorption. Um, so, so this was recognized by these authors, Chaipas, Chinoff, and Boyarsky, and then Ptolemy, the collaboration, suggested some ideas to try to alleviate this and involving shifting the way you organize the graphene and things. But, you know, I, I think it's just a nice morality tale that, you know, there's such an elementary piece of quantum mechanics that could have been observed, uh, you know, could have been noted well in advance of, of, of two years ago. Um, so that's maybe, that's a nice particle physics example of quantum noise showing up. Um, this is a, obviously maybe the most famous example of quantum limited uh, detection in fundamental physics. This is LIGO. Um, so, so LIGO, I want to emphasize the scale, you know, it's a 40 kilogram mirror. That's what's shown in this little box. It's on a four kilometer baseline. It's in a vacuum chamber. That's a massive thing. And then on the left is the, the noise budget, the nominal noise budget for advanced LIGO. Um, and I just want to highlight, there's all of these things like seismic noise and, uh, coding Brownian noise and everything. But in the detection band, the dominant noise source is this purple thing labeled quantum noise. And so in that sense, I'll, I'll explain what that curve is in a second, but this, this is the sort of prototype of a quantum limited detector system. Um, the dominant noise comes from quantum mechanics. So I want to give a sort of heuristic sketch of what that purple curve is. Um, so really the canonical argument for this goes back to caves in the 80s. So they were trying to figure out what is the quantum mechanics of the noise in the interferometer. So, so this is a cartoon. Um, this is a the, the wave function of of say the position of the mirror in LIGO. Okay, and it should really be drawn in one dimension. Sorry, I don't know why I made it a two D blob. Um, so, so imagine that what you want to do is you want to monitor the mirror's position continuously in time. So, so let's discretize that process and measure it like once, and then wait, and then measure it, and so forth. So, so the best thing you would think you can do is you can prepare the mirror in some ground state wave function or some Gaussian. Um, where its its position uncertainty uh, is small, and you and you minimize the product of delta x and delta p. So in the first time step, you're going to measure the position. You want to know where the mirror is. So regardless of how exactly you do this, the one thing you're supposed to be doing here is decreasing the uncertainty in the position. Um, however, by Heisenberg uncertainty, that means that the momentum uncertainty has to increase since I was in a minimal uncertainty initial state. So that's fine for the first measurement. In principle, the first measurement delta x could be as small as I want. The problem is that now I have to wait a second and then do a second measurement. And when I do that, under just free evolution in the Schrodinger equation, the uh, width and position space of the wave function of the mirror has to expand. And it has to expand, it diffuses uh, by an amount proportional to delta p. In other words, it's worse, it expands more if I did a better measurement in the first step. So you have this trade-off of how well you can measure in the first step versus how well you can measure in the second step. Um, and there's some optimization where you want to just maintain the, the minimum amount of noise at, at each step. Uh, and so just solving this quadratic equation gives you this formula, which people call the standard quantum limit. And we'll talk a lot about this as we go, but this is just some sort of estimate for a benchmark of noise. Um, it says, how well can I continuously monitor the location of the mirror? It's a universal formula. It only depends on h bar, the mass of the mirror, that's m, and t, which is the rate at which I'm doing these measurements. It doesn't care how you do the measurement. It doesn't really care if it's optics or whatever. And just for context, if you put like the numbers for a 40 kilogram mirror and say 100 hertz 
uh, wave that you're interested in, you find that the uncertainty here is about 10 to the negative 19 meters. So this is this famous LIGO measuring its mirror to you know a thousandth the size of a proton um, sort of phrase. So the, the rest of the talk is going to be basically about what can you do with various devices that are that are that are operating at the level where this is the dominant uh, noise effect. <clears throat> so just some some comments on it. So it's called people call this the standard quantum limit. That's a bit of a loaded term. Um, one thing I want to emphasize it has, it's it's not specific to position measurements. It's there's a, there's an analogous thing for angular momentum or spin or in a field theory for a field amplitude or or whatever. Uh, just any degree of freedom for which there's a, a conjugate variable. Um, it has a simple interpretation. It means that you're you're sensing an object at the scale of its vacuum fluctuations. So I just rewrote the formula here, uh, replacing time with a frequency. Um, and this formula, the square root h bar over m omega, that's just the width of the ground state wave function of a of a harmonic oscillator. So it's just saying that you're 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 observing it at the scale of its vacuum fluctuations. Um, I'm not going to talk a lot about how exactly you reach the SQL, just because there's nothing magic about doing it. All, all reaching the SQL means fundamentally is you just have isolated yourself from technical noise, so thermal noise, gas, whatever, um, and, and you just have sufficiently good readout of the laser or the microwave or, or whatever detector you're fundamentally using. Um, there's no sort of you know voodoo that goes into it. Uh, there is something that is a little voodoo, which is this last comment, which is that the standard quantum limit is not actually a bound. So you can get around this argument I just presented. Um, and I'll talk about that a little towards the end. But it's it's worth emphasizing there are sort of sub-SQL uh, measurements now in many contexts, including LIGO. Um, just since this is a particle physics audience, just to highlight another example where this is uh, showing up all the time now is in axion searches. So. This is searches for the dark matter axion um, in the microwave band. So this is for ADM axes of this style. This picture is from a haystack. So these are searches where the, the axion is some stuff filling your lab. You put up a tin can. Maybe it's a superconducting tin can. Uh, what you do is you look for the axion to start ringing up uh, the can or the cavity, whatever you want to call it. Um, the way you do it is this diagram on the top right. You imagine you have an applied magnetic field. The axion can come and convert to a photon, and you're just trying to measure. Um, the, sometimes it's phrases the the presence of these photons. It's actually a little more subtle than that. You're trying to measure the fact that the cavity field, the microwave field inside the cavity, is driven slightly out of the vacuum state. Um, and in particular, the, the modern experiments of this type are really working in the limit where you're looking for the process where the, the, the like some mode in the cavity starts in the vacuum and then is excited to some state, which is actually like a, more like a coherent state and not a single photon state. Uh, in particular, it's a state where the average number of photons can be substantially less than one. And you're trying to detect that transition. Um, so this is just another example of a detection that's sort of at the standard quantum limit. You're sensing at the scale of vacuum fluctuations of now a microwave cavity mode. You know, and this is the second comment, you know, you can do better than the, the standard quantum limit. So this is this beautiful graph that um, my colleague Evan Hall from, from LIGO made for me. Um, well, I made it for his own purposes and let me, lets me use it. Um, this is just a, the noise budget in LIGO as a function of time. And what you can see is that at, at 2017, you start beating the standard quantum. So this blue curve is roughly the SQL. Orange is when you start injecting a simple type of squeeze of light, it's called. And green and purple, you have more more sophisticated kinds of squeeze light called frequency-dependent squeeze. doesn't matter. I just want to highlight that these are there's known techniques to just continuously drive noise below the standard quantum limit, and, and it's used in very much real detectors. I also want to emphasize that it's not like pointless. <laughs> so <laughs> this is preaching to the choir usually, but if you if you lower the strain noise by a factor of of, of ten percent, you you improve how far away you can see black holes by a factor of a hundred percent because the signal is one over r squared. <clears throat> so so these you know these are not just technical improvements; they are they massively change the reach of the experiment. So, so those are just motivating examples. And in the rest of the talk, I'll pivot a little bit to stuff I'm more closely um, tied to. So I, I want to give one example of a sort of series of dark matter and then maybe new 
neutrino experiments using essentially LIGO, um, just scaled to smaller devices. And then because Kieran emailed me and said he was interested in this idea, uh, I'll talk a little bit about these ideas of testing quantum gravity, um, and in particular, testing them in particle physics experiments like CAST. Um, so, so we have reviews from my group from on both of these topics. And if you're interested, obviously, I recommend uh, these. Um, this old one holds up really well, believe it or not. So, mm -hmm. so I want to start with this particle physics stuff. So, so this is a simple question that 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 I got involved in a couple of uh, maybe more like six years ago now, which is, how well can I measure a particle colliding with a quantum mechanical sensor? So, so here's a cartoon of LIGO. So this is a cavity, a laser is driving the cavity, and there's like this movable mirror. Uh, and so instead of looking for a gravitational wave to come make this thing swing, I just want to have something hit the mirror, maybe bounce off or get stuck. And I want to read out this sort of impulsive force uh, that, that just hits the, the mirror at an instant in time. So you can ask this question for LIGO itself, but you can ask it for devices of wildly varying sizes from single ions to sort of like hundreds of kilograms. Um, and they can be tethered devices like the LIGO mirror, which is the cartoon, or just for variety, they can be levitated. So this thing on the bottom, I'll talk a lot about this guy. This is an optically tweezed bead. The bead is about a microgram in this picture. Um, and, and these things all obey the same kind of quantum limits. So in particular, if you're looking for an impulse, there's a very simple limit. Um, the, the data looks sort of like this thing I'm showing on the bottom right. So you just monitor where's the where's the mirror, where's the bead as a function of time. If something hits it, it'll cause the bead to ring. And you'll see some, you know, this is a little exaggerated, but you'll see some ring down signal like, like so. And the question is, uh, how, if I'm at the standard quantum limit for measuring where the mirror or the bead is, how small of an impulse can I detect? And the answer, again, is some very universal formula that I wrote in the box, the standard quantum limit for impulses, which, again, depends only on the mass of the, the mechanical element and, and its frequency, if it's harmonically trapped. I'll give some numbers for this in a second. So I, if for the next like four or five slides, I want to talk about what can you do in particle physics by, by using devices uh, of various sizes operating at this standard quantum limit. So this is, this is the dense slide, I apologize. Um, but I just want to highlight the sort of scales. So, so this is a, a set of an experiment and two proposals, one of which is now quickly becoming an experiment, um, where I want to emphasize maybe some of the limitations of this approach here. So the, the left, I'm showing this microgram scale bead. Um, and we did a search uh, at the very beginning of COVID actually using calibration data because we had nothing else and we couldn't go to the lab. Um, this was a search for looking for a pretty exotic dark matter model that we cooked up just to look for it. Um, but it, it, this was uh, sort of chunks of dark matter made up of, of, of quark nugget type stuff, like couples to the some long range force of the standard model. The other thing I want to emphasize is this is um, all these these limits that are blobbed out um, were the xenon limits. And so we're competing with xenon um, with this one microgram sphere uh from maybe a couple days of data and you're, and you're making these these sort of blue dot limits so what this highlights is this approach is good for things that are long range coupled um of course it's terrible compared to xenon for anything that's just like a contact interaction these other experiments are just showing that you can do different maybe interesting things at smaller scales so a microgram is sort of big in this world. These are these are nanogram scale beads in the middle. And the idea here was you could look for actually coherent elastic scattering of light dark matter candidates and probe some actually pretty unconstrained parameter space. I think these yellow blobs are like uh, these phonon detectors that people are trying to build now. And, and there's an interesting limit of trying to go to like, what's the smallest detector possible? You can just trap a single ion or single electron. And you, you look for things to elastically scatter off of it. Um, and actually, I believe Dima Budker is doing a version of this now, looking for milli charged dark matter. I actually want to focus a little more on stuff beyond dark matter. Um, you know, I think let me let me say the punchline in my opinion on this is the, the technique we can what you can do with this is build an extraordinarily low threshold detector. So these are detectors whose energy thresholds are orders of magnitude below chemical energies. So if you need to go below xenon energies. Here's a way to do it. 
obviously the problem is that there's small detectors. So, you know, and if you need volume, uh, you know, you're gonna have to work hard. And so, you know, we have ideas about making many of these, but, you know, in full disclosure, I think for dark matter, that is the difficulty with this. These are, these are small things and I have to sort of individually read them out, say with lasers. So that's kind of led us into thinking about something a little more sophisticated, but where we don't need to have a dark matter signal. We can look for new physics in other ways, um, where particularly where we're going to create it in the in the system itself. So, so this is a paper that uh, I wrote with Kyle um, Kyle Leach, who's at Mines Colorado, and Dave Moore, who's at Yale, uh, trying to do some sort of precision electroweak physics and maybe searches for sterile neutrinos. So, so this is a cartoon of the setup. Um, the 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 lasers and the in this optical tweezer are the same thing we were just looking at. So I have an optical field I can tweeze little beads. Uh, I can measure the position of the beads optically. And then the sort of two innovations were, as a detector, we surround this with a pixel, some pixel calorimeter. Uh, and why would we do that? The reason is because you, we realize you could fill up the beads. You can actually dope them with radioisotopes many kinds of radio isotopes, almost anything you want, you can put into these beads. They're just porous silica, so you can fill them up. Um, and then the idea here would be, like, let's say I put beta emitters into the sphere. Uh, then if, if a beta emitter, if a beta emission happens, um, there's some nucleus that decays. The daughter nucleus uh, tends to be trapped still in the sphere. It gets stopped within a couple of nanometers. Uh, so that causes the sphere to recoil, which I can read out optically. Uh, in a beta event, there's a beta electron that also flies out. That's why we surround this thing with pixel calorimeters. You can catch the beta. And so then I have the the vector momentum of the daughter nucleus, the vector momentum of the of the beta electron. And so then just by momentum conservation, I can reconstruct the momentum of anything else that flies out. For example, the neutrino, or maybe an axion does something like this or whatever. So any invisible particle that I can't actually directly detect, I can just kinematically reconstruct. Um, for any experimentalists who are interested in this, you know, we're going to focus now on 100 nanometer size beads, um, which is a nice limit. Anyway, we'll, we'll see why. So um, I want to say that this technique actually works. So I'm I'm very pleased by this. Uh, this works exactly like we wrote it up. So so this is an experiment from well that was published um, two months ago now, out of Yale with with my collaborator Dave. Um, this is a picture of the actual thing. You, you're seeing some electrodes. There's this bead floating in the middle. This is a, this thing is actually a micron, not 100 nanometers. Uh, and they figured out a very clever way to dope this with radon daughters, so the alpha emitters. And what I'm showing on the right is an actual event um, of, of readout of this thing. So the, the, top, the top two panels are the cleanest, obviously. These are the, the ring down impulse signals I was suggesting. And you can really see that they ring down. They have the amplitude you expect for, a, for an alpha emitter, you know, these sort of, um, you know, uh, MEV scale decay energies. Um, on the bottom panel, uh, there's something I hadn't really highlighted, but it is important for us. You can also read out the charge on the sphere uh, just by applying an electric field to it and seeing where it moves to, to the precision of single electron charges. So, so when you have one of these events, you can actually just m monitor the fact that the charge on the sphere changes as the alpha goes out and strips charge out of the sphere. So you get this nice correlated signal. Um, in this example, you get 2D reconstruction of the momentum. The, the third axis isn't so good in this device. Um, but but yeah, this this is as a point of principle, this sort of setup really, really works. So what are we gonna do with this? Um, the main things we were interested in, the, what we wrote it up originally was to look for heavy sterile neutrinos. How heavy, I'll show you in a second. So this would be this idea that there's a fourth neutrino species, and it just the electron neutrino can sometimes oscillate into it. Um, so it's a rare event search. Uh, there's various reasons you might want to do that. Um, it's a rare, yeah, it's a rare event search. There's another idea that I'll highlight that my postdoc had, which is you could maybe try to do just precision nuclear physics with this thing. <laughs> so as a search for sterile neutrinos, here's here's some projections. So 
So I want to highlight sort of scales. So again, these are devices operating at the standard quantum limit. What can you do? Um, the left plot is is very conservative. So this is uh, steroles from you know a few hundred keV to uh, you know a few thousand keV, um, with loaded with various isotopes in one sphere that you're watching for one month. Um, the gray stuff is all of the lab bounds. So if these are the dark matter, there's additional astrophysics bounds that I'm not showing because this is a search that doesn't require them to be the dark matter. They just have to exist at all. Um, the the y-axis is the mixing angle. So this is just the probability that the electron flavored neutrino oscillates to the new thing. Um, you can see there's various isotopes you can use to cover different parameter regimes and so forth. Um, so then the more aggressive thing to do would be, like, okay, how, how could you scale this even if I don't allow myself to improve the quantum noise, you know, as a particle physicist, it's natural to say, well, I want like a bunch of detectors and so forth. And so on the right, this is like a more aggressive plan we have um, to, to build an array of these spheres. Um, you can build an array of these using techniques that are now routinely used in a bunch of um, neutral atom quantum computing architectures. So for example, people have prepped a thousand site Rydberg uh, arrays. Many people have done that now. So it's not actually so crazy to think about doing this. Um, and then you want to watch them for a little longer. That's actually a little diff more difficult. But, but nevertheless, if you can do this, you can start cutting into this like kind of crazy parameter regime, where in fact, if you load the spheres with tritium uh, and you're doing it you know, at this kind of scale, you, you start getting into these dotted curves where um, this really actually is a viable dark matter candidate still. So, so we're excited about this, but again, this is you know this is sort of down the down the line. This thing on the left is we're building it now. <laughs> I want to highlight this precision nuclear physics thing because I think it's cool. I'm really excited about it. So this is entirely due to my my postdoc Giacomo, who's who's excellent. Um, you know, he pointed out that if you just take the beta decay spectrum, forget heavy steroids, normal beta decay. Um, the beta decay spectrum has a simple dependence on the angle between the emitted electron and neutrino. And so I'm, I'm, I'm suppressing some details and he would be mad that I did this, but uh, roughly speaking, there's some simple angular distribution um, of the decay rate where you have a constant term and a term that's proportional to the cosine of, of that angle. And the idea here was just that we have a very sensitive measurement of the, the, the theta e nu angle because as I've explained. So the, the coefficient here uh, in, a, in a gamma of Teller decay in the standard model that are exactly one and a third to tree, at tree level. And so then people have thought before, this isn't our idea, that you could look for, say, new, new symmetries in the electroweak sector, for example, t tensor currents in addition to the normal vector axial um, that would actually change these coefficients. And so comparing to what people have done trying to measure the spectrum, you know, on paper from a simple sort of Monte Carlo analysis, it looks like that if you can load uh, 66 nickel, um, which is, there's nothing that seems like that's impossible, and measure sort of about 10 to the 10 to the 6 to 10 to the 8 events, um, which is one to a few spheres worth, um, then you can start constraining these coefficients, you know, to, to substantially better than, than anybody has done before. Sorry, but uh, sorry, I have a quick question if you don't mind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, shouldn't this be also constrained by just electric precision data? Like this is all standard model, right? So of course, yeah, that's what I'm saying. So I'm what I'm claiming here is that it on paper it looks like you could do better than all the current electric precision data. Okay. Okay. Yeah. All My right. understanding is that the best measurement of this currently comes from decays of uh, I believe it's lithium. It's a lithium isotope that decays to mm -hmm. two alphas. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, I mean it's quite remarkable, but yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, to be to be determined, right? So I should say this is unpublished work. So I'm just sort of promoting mm -hmm. this as we're writing it up. Um, mm -hmm. Not an easy measurement. Yeah. Uh, the systematics here have to be understood more carefully, for sure. Okay, thanks. If there's any other questions, by the way, this is the perfect time. Yeah, maybe I, I will. So I, I feel like you're leading me to this question by having the, the on the previous slide, uh, you, you had tritium as one of your curves. Is it completely hopeless to imagine a Ptolemy 
thing with some beads where you engineer the trapping of them in some way to get around this. Yeah, um, this is my kind of my kind of question. Um, <laughs> okay, so so could you could you, could you do tall? Yeah, okay, so um, maybe so. Okay, so can you do Ptolemy? I think the answer is no. I'll tell you why in a second. There's a simpler quote unquote measurement, which is just measuring the neutrino, the normal neutrino mass this way. Um, so to measure the neutrino mass, assuming it's say of order 100 milliEV, has the same problem as Ptolemy, except that I don't need as much tritium. <laughs> uh, it means I need to be able to resolve kicks at, at some scale. And so if you put in the those numbers I showed earlier, for this system, what this says is, if I have the sphere that's 100 nanometers, I load it with tritium. Um, in order to get the momentum uncertainty of the initial state good enough to see kicks of order 100 milliEV, assuming I can average down 10 to the 6 events statistically, the answer is what you would actually need is to, um, to, to, to squeeze the momentum state of the sphere by, by a factor of 10. Um, which in position space means I'm going to delocalize it. That's how you solve the, the Ptolemy problem. You actually can just make the, the wave function broad. <laughs> um, so this numerically requires 10 dB of squeezing, so, so 10, uh, one order of magnitude. Um, for comparison, the light going into LIGO is around 10 dB squeeze right now. Now that's the light going in. It's not the state of the mass. Um, and so we're not you know, we're, we're working hard on this to figure out, can you actually try to do this? Um, but, you know, in principle, this is not even that crazy. Uh, the maybe harder part is you need a lot of spheres because you're going to be trying to do tritium endpoint measurements. Um, but again, you know, it sort of looks like about a thousand spheres could could do it. So, you know, I we're working on this. This is definitely a brutally difficult measurement, but it, it's sort of a lot easier than some other things we've thought of doing. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I, I think in principle, it's also definitely this is a solution. Um, it won't work for Ptolemy because the amount of tritium you would need to do Ptolemy is about 100 grams, is my understanding. And so these spheres are femtograms. So that means you need 10 to the 17 spheres or something. And I just don't, okay. I don't dare dream such things. For, for just an endpoint mass measurement, it's a lot less uh, constraining. Okay, that's particle physics. Uh, uh, Bruce, uh, Bruce had a question. Maybe yeah, sorry, sorry, a question. Sorry, um, si since we are doing questions, um, yeah, just so that I understand, you're doing. You you implied you're doing individual nuclear decay measurements. Now, I mean, I understand that these spheres are tiny. Yeah, but, but so are nuclei. So are so are the energies from individual nuclear decays and measured in in mev the masses of these spheres are still enormous yeah um so uh, are you actually looking at individual decays are you looking at the 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 brownian motion of this thing and um, or the whatever the equivalent of brownian motion of this thing under repeated kicks are you looking at the endpoint cases uh yeah, you are. You Maybe are... my imagination is just being challenged a little bit, but don't... no, I. That's that's good that you're. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's actually kind of insane. I'm. I've gotten but, but, used but to in, it. But in ME, in MEV, this the the mass of one of these things is still in the billions. That's right. Um, so the the answer is yeah. You see individual kicks. You're not looking for the Brownian motion. You you really resolve event by event each decay, um, and it is true that this means that the energy threshold of this device is astronomically small um the way you can maybe feel better about this is what we are reading out is the momentum not the energy per se yeah. usually people think these are the same but in momentum units you're measuring in this example you know a hundred mev or something yep um and so maybe i should have put the number sorry but if you put in numbers for this formula so this mm -hmm. is um, what's the momentum of the sphere that I can detect um, with a femtogram here and a hundred kilohertz trapping frequency. This is ten keV. Wow. Yeah. So, yeah, that's just how it is. Okay. Yeah, these, these are ridiculously sensitive measurements. <laughs> I mean, another another example is. Um, 
this device in a vacuum chamber can read out every time a four Kelvin helium atom gets stuck on it, you you see it. Yeah, no, the, the fact that it's the momentum that you're measuring, it makes makes much better sense of it. Yeah. That 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 makes that that's that's helpful. Because Good. that I can that that I can believe. Um if it if the actual thing being measured is you know is the energy or the speed or whatever then it then, then it becomes very difficult but if it's the it specifically the momentum that you're measuring then okay yeah for sure all right thank you for clarifying sure Okay, yeah, I, I guess if there's any other questions about sort of particle physics, it's a good time because I'm going to pivot kind of wildly into gravity. Um, but all right, let me just do it. Maybe so, I, maybe I can't. I just yeah, maybe, just to get that out of the way. Um, so the I mean, with the issue with the dark matter searches is just like the size of this thing to capture enough flux. You need to just repeat. You have multiple of these things spread over some volume, like. Is that basically just brute force? Like you just have to, because I guess with these like like a tra tra trapped things, like you just need to actually have multiple of these things repeated. There's no sort of simple way that you could like, um, you know, like with you know when people talk about like atom interferometry, they talk about like um, addressing ma many of these ultra cold clouds of atoms with like the same laser beam. Is there some kind of like where you could simplify the setup to make that not so crazy? Yeah, that's a good. Yeah, um, I don't think I have any material, but yes, the answer is yes, and we we think about that kind of actively. So you can definitely, I think we now built something where with one laser you can trap and read out about a hundred beads, um, and that's just sort of a thing that we built to see how it works. And you know, with levitated systems, there's a fundamental limit to uh, because I have to levitate them with the optical laser. I just need a laser that's sufficiently powerful to hold the mass up. <laughs> um, the readout is unclear how well you can scale it, like how many, but yeah, for sure. It's not, it's, it's, it's much better than like, I need one laser per bead. I mean, you, you could probably do a hundred to a thousand beads per laser. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. So I'll, I'll, this is just a couple of slides, but but since it was um, sort of requested and I like it, and this is really most of my, well, not most of it, it's, my, it's half of my work. Uh, I'll talk about a subset of this idea about testing quantum gravity uh, in a real experiment. So so let me throw Dyson under the bus. Um, so, so this is a, a beautiful paper that changed my life when I read it in grad school. So, so Dyson's asking this question, can I detect a graviton? Um, and, and I want to highlight part of this abstract or the introduction. He says, the talk is concerned with the question, is it in principle possible to detect individual gravitons? Or in other words, is it possible to detect the quantization of the gravitational field? And the spoiler for what I'm about to say is that the answer to the first half of this is yes. And the answer to the second half is no. <laughs> Uh, so Dyson actually conflated these two questions, um, and it took us a little while to unwind this. Uh, but it, but okay, you'll, I'll, I'll explain in some detail. So so why did I start thinking about this? Um, this is a not really why, but this is a cool way of explaining it in a particle physics audience. So so Nick Rod came to me, who's now my colleague. He's uh, your um, uh, your your country mate. Uh, now, so Nick Nick came to me and he said, "Hey, I think I can detect individual gravitons. Let's write it off." So, the, the the idea was the following: Here's Cast. This is this thing at CERN. Um, it's a big magnet uh, with an X-ray photo detector at the end of it, <clears throat> roughly speaking. And it's it's been known for a long time, um, back to Felton Stavelsky at least, um, that in the presence of an external magnetic field, an incoming gravitational wave can convert into electromagnetic radiation. Or in other words, a graviton can convert to a photon. And this is just a simple prediction of the Maxwell equations in curved space time. So in cast specifically, if you put in some numbers, um, the probability for this graviton to photon conversion is given by some simple mixing formula, uh, where d is the size of the magnet 
and B is the strength of the magnet. And so um, this the number for for Cas is the the conversion is about ten to the negative thirty three probability. So really small, okay. But what is the number of gravitons in a gravitational wave? So if I take a gravitational wave event and I ask how many gravitons are in the wave, um, given the strain, the frequency of the wave, a cross section area of the the the, the B field in my device, and, and time for the event, um, you can just put in all these numbers. Uh, and you find that with a strain of 10 to the negative 20, which is like a very detectable LIGO scale event and 10, 10, 10 millisecond pulse, uh, you find that actually the number of gravitons multiplied by this conversion probability is more than one. It can Sorry, be much more. Can I ask us, well, probably a stupid question in this context. Yeah. What do you, like, what do you mean by a single graviton? Well, that's the whole rest of the talk. <laughs> okay. Yeah, Fair all enough. I mean, all I mean here is that. Um, so, are you is is the proxy for a for, when it converts the proxy for a photon count is somehow you're you're tying that to a graviton count. In the sense great. that, am I am I thinking of this as a wave where where you excite a one particle state that gets converted to a photon and then that conversion or whatever that's called you're sort of you know counting it as a graviton or something. Yeah, 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 yeah. Good. So this is how Dyson kind of phrased it. And I'm going to argue that that's actually not necessary to interpret it that way. It is certainly consistent to interpret it that way, right? So that, that's what the Feynman diagram would literally, you know, say. However, we're going to argue that you don't have to think of it in terms of individual gravitons. All right. Okay. So that's my, that was my question. Okay. Yeah, it's exactly the right question. Um. So, so, so what I want to say here, just to start with this NP is greater than one statement is just that, okay, if for some reason there's a source of X-ray frequency uh, gravitational waves, okay, that's its own issue. Supposing there was one and it, and you and you shine it at Cas, um, then Cas will will light up. You'll you'll see you'll see clicks in the photo detector. Um, and kind of interestingly, the the beam of gravitons, if you want to think of it that way, it would be dilute. So if you calculate the number of gravitons per de Broglie cell in this wave. Uh, it's much less than one, so it's sort of like a, you know, it's like particle dark matter versus ultralight dark matter. It's 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 not wave like. It's like a dilute um, gas of gravitons coming into the detector. <clears throat> so so you think, well, oh, cool. So you see this, you know, I've got single gravitons and I'm done. Like I know gravity's quantum, and we should go, you know, work on string theory. Um, but I, I we want to push back on this a little bit. So so here's a more systematic way of asking, how would I interpret that data? So let's say I see cast click and I, I know it's from gravity somehow. So let's compare these two models. So the, sort of a null hypothesis model is I quantize gravity perturbatively. I treat it like any normal quantum field theory. And we know that this is a perfectly good EFT at these energies. Um, so this is this is fine. And so you can kind of compare this to like a toy model where the graviton is classical. So just some classical external wave, like this question was just getting at. I just have some classical external uh, gravitation, classical external gravitational field come in. And I wanna ask like, can that experiment that I just did distinguish between these two models? <laughs> and I'll even let the graviton, uh, the uh, gravitational waves be like randomly classical. So it's like an add some noise that way. Um, so it is an old story in quantum optics that the answer is no. So the, the quantum optics version of this is, um, does the photoelectric effect imply that the photon exists? And the answer is no in the following sense. So so here's a photoelectric effect diagram. I have some chunk of metal. Yeah, so, so this was actually my precise question. This is in the context of exactly this, that you know, really are you, is that is that what you mean by a graviton, quant, a quanta of graviton or something? Um, yeah, so, okay, fine. Then I, I understand what you're talking about. Okay, good. Mm. Yeah, so, so so to make it precise for people who haven't thought about this kind of stuff, I, and this is, I think, just a nice thing to know about photoelectric effect for everybody on Earth. The photoelectric effect, um, you can explain it classically in the following way. You, you have to assume that the detector, which is full of electrons that are bound, and then there's some conduction band or they can fly off or whatever, right? What, what you do is you shine light at this metal and you, you have some, some electron counter somewhere. Um, and the question is, if I see clicks, you know, corresponding to these individual electron excitations, um, do I need to explain those by photon absorption? 
So, so more mathematically, I can compare two models like I'm showing here. So one where I quantize the incoming um, electromagnetic field and one where I, I just have it be classical. So you can just like open Sakurai or you can open Mandel and Wolf, which is a great book, um, and just ask what is the, the rate of excitations of the electrons from the ground state to the conduction band. And in both of these models, you get the exact same formula. Uh, it's just proportional to the intensity of the incoming field, which, sorry, I should have put a bracket around it, either a quantum expectation or a classical one, doesn't matter. But just the, it's proportional to the intensity. There's a, there's a theta function that enforces what you would normally think of as energy conservation, but it's really a resonance condition classically. It says that the wave, the frequency of the incoming electromagnetic wave has to be um, uh, bigger than the band gap of, the, of the, these electrons. And there's this coefficient eta, which is going to be important in a second, which is the detector efficiency. The eta is just the fractional power that's absorbed um, by the detector. And so what this what this says is that if I just seeing photoelectron clicks, and in particular, you know, just seeing that they're proportional to the incoming intensity and that they obey some kind of energy conservation, that can be explained with a classical incident wave. And this is a sort of underappreciated fact. So then in quantum optics, there's this whole question about like, well, what, what, what can't I explain with a classical incoming wave? And there is this sequence of ideas that was developed um, about testing non-classicality. So, so if I take, uh, say, a monochromatic, just one mode of the electromagnetic field, let's say it's, it's, it's got an annihilation operator B, I can form the coherent states of that, which I'm writing down as beta. And it's an old result um, that any state, any arbitrary quantum state of that mode, pure state, mixed state, whatever, um, you can always express it in this form where it's an integral over all the coherent states labeled beta with some weighting function P of beta, uh, which has to be normalized like a probability distribution. So this is just like writing a, a density matrix on a position basis. It's just nice to do it into the coherent states. And then there's, there's this sort of theorem um, which is the following. So this looks like what I'm doing is I'm saying any, any state of one mode of the electromagnetic field or the gravitational field, I can almost write it as a, as a classical distribution over coherent states. And that is true if this function P of beta is positive. So if that, if that function is positive, then this really is an ensemble, just a classical mixture of coherent states. So it's a classical mixture of basically classical states. Um, and that's going to look like a classical observable. On the other hand, if P of beta is negative somewhere, uh, and there are quantum states for which this is the case, for example, squeeze states, uh, then you can actually find some observable in the detector output that you can show you cannot explain by one of these semi-classical radiation models. So a, a really beautiful example is this idea of measuring sub-Poissonian noise. So this is, suppose I just shine light at a photo detector like literally the photoelectric effect I just showed you, um, the rate at which those clicks come in is fixed by this simple calculation. So the average is fixed by this. What you can ask is what's the variance in the rate of the clicks? And you can compare that to Poisson statistics. So if I just send in a, a coherent state, uh, I'm going to get Poisson clicks on the detector. If I send in something noisier like a thermal state, then I'll get super Poisson clicks, meaning that the variance uh, in the click rate is bigger than the average. Um, however, in quantum mechanics, you can have sub Poisson clicks, and, and this is formalized by this equation on the bottom right. You can just, in any arbitrary state, you can calculate uh, in perturbation theory the, the, that the variance in the click rate is equal to the average plus this correction factor, which is like the eta squared, so the detector efficiency squared, times how long you're watching. Oh, well, sorry, I could have divided the whatever. The, the, the detector efficiency squared um, times this integral over a positive quantity, the variance in the intensity of the incoming state, multiplied by this P of beta weight. And the point is that if P of beta can be negative, then this integral can actually be negative. And so you can get um, fluctuations where the variance is less than the mean. Uh, but you can only do that if P of beta is negative. And so this really distinguishes between a classical incoming state and a quantum mechanical one. <laughs> so uh, I should say this was observed in 
quantum in optics in the 80s. So you produce a squeeze state of light, you shine it at some photodiode, and you, you measure these click rates, and you know you show that you can really get these sub-poisson counts. So that, that's, a, that's a, a well-established experimental thing. So then the, then the remaining question is, can I do it in gravitons? <laughs> Uh, and the answer is no. So th the answer is no for a simple reason. So to detect the sub Poisson statistics, you need a, an order one detector efficiency. So this formula I just showed that, that measures the deviation from Poisson statistics is proportional to the detector efficiency squared, actually. And and I showed you a minute ago that in CASP, for example, the detector efficiency is like 10 to the negative, uh, sorry, it should be 10 to the negative 31. So, what this means is that uh, this is zero on the right side, no matter what state you throw into cast. <clears throat> and what that means is you're always just going to see Poisson clicks. And what this is saying is just that the, the noise that you see in the, in the outcome is totally dominated by the detector itself. It's not dominated by the noise in the state coming in. <clears throat> so, so even if you have a source of these sub-Poisson gravitons, um, you're not going to actually be able to know, know that you have them. It's just not detectable. We kind of thought, like, is it possible in the known laws of physics to do it in, like, okay, I guess maybe, um, but just to give some some sense of scale, to get to get an order one detector efficiency with this architecture, you need you need a B field that's ten to the thirteen Tesla, or you need to make it the size of the galaxy or some interpolation, and you know, so this this is this is okay, maybe this is allowed by by nature, I don't know, um, but it's definitely not happening on Earth. <laughs> Um, just to highlight this, I'm going to run out of time, but there have been various claims that you could try to look for quantum signatures in gravitation waves coming into LIGO, and for this exact same reason, that that, that is just false. You cannot do that. Um, the, the same thing happens in LIGO. So in, in LIGO, you're not counting clicks, you're, you're measuring the, the sort of waveform, and the analogous thing would be to look for uh, uh, quantum noise in the shape of the waveform. <clears throat> And you can run through basically the same calculations where you, you ask, okay, what's the size of the variance of the waveform? Uh, and you can you can show that the, there's there's a term, it's a half in some units. This is just the, the vacuum fluctuations in LIGO we talked about earlier. This is the standard standard quantum limit in the readout. And then you want to compare that to the noise in the signal. And the noise in the signal, um, okay, there is a difference. A quantum model of the of the signal can make smaller noise than a classical model can. This is sort of the analog of sub Poisson statistics. However, that's imprinted onto the LIGO output uh, with the detector efficiency sitting in front of it. And in LIGO, the, the analogous thing, the detector efficiency is 10 to negative 20. So, you know, the you can see the classical part of the signal, obviously we've detected that in LIGO because the signal is so huge. But if you want to see the deviation in the noise between the classical model and the quantum model is utterly impossible because it's controlled by an order one number multiplied by 10 to the negative 20. <laughs> um, so, so you know, Frank Wilczek and other people have, have written these papers claiming you you could say shoot a squeeze gravitation wave at LIGO and, and see quantum effects and that is just not true. Um, so, so punchlines lines of that, okay, you can detect single gravitons, like I can make a detector that will see clicks uh, and then it, this should be totally de-romanticized to you by now. That's just a simple statement about whether I'm detecting clicks or, or waveforms. Um, however, any such measurement, you could explain it by a classical signal plus quantum noise in the detector. Same conclusion for, for LIGO. And so just to emphasize, to rule out, a to really see a, a provably quantum thing hitting a gravitational detector, first of all, you need a source of non-classical gravitational waves. Unclear where that's coming from. and Worse, really, you need a detector that is sort of order one efficient. So, so this leads to a whole other can of worms, which is, can I do an experiment on a tabletop where I'm not measuring gravitons, but I'm measuring something like uh, directly observing superpositions of space-time through sort of superposed Newtonian potentials? And you know, this is more of like a John Bell-style question. Um, and I'm not going to go through this, obviously, but the answer is probably yes. Um, th this is actually probably going to be doable, not tomorrow, but within the next decade or two. And this is review. I'd be happy to ask, you know, answer any questions about this. 
Um, isn't that this whole thing that uh, Catherine Zurich and uh, Eric Berlin they were trying to do on a tabletop experiment with entangled states and what have you? I mean, is that really a test of well, quantum gravity in some sense? Or I don't even actually understand the uh, understand the setup. So you know, like uh, I don't understand it well enough. So I don't know if if, if you have thoughts on that. I have a lot of thoughts. Let me give my conclusion slide, and then I can come back to that. Would that work? Yeah, yeah, sure. It's it's uh, you don't have to. I mean, I would love I would love to. I just um because it's on the hour, and so people want to leave, but I want to make sure I have my conclusion. <laughs> so, um, uh, so yeah, just just some final thoughts. You know, so I'm I'm a long termist on this. I'm I'm very deeply interested in what we can do in the next five to ten years, and I'm focused pretty heavily on that now. However. I want to emphasize that th this idea that you're going to have quantum noise and you're going to have to engineer it is just going to keep coming up. Um, it's not going to come up in every context. Sometimes you're just limited by volume, but it's going to keep coming up. Um, and, and well, that's exciting. So what, what do you need? You, you need higher, high, higher isolation from the environment, higher quality factors, technical lingo. We need better ways to, to get below the standard quantum limit. I mean, squeezing is great, but it's limited by optical loss. We need to figure out how to scale things for particle physics and for rare event things. You need many devices. How do you really do this? Um, but but this, the, the Yoda here is supposed to be hinting at this last thing, which is, you know, it's unclear how far you can push this. And in particular, the formalism of quantum mechanics itself does not impose a limit on the noise. So it says there will be noise if you do certain things, but it but then it says you can get rid of the noise if you do other things. And in, in particular, you know, you're allowed to measure things noiselessly within just pure quantum mechanics. So, so we don't really know where this kind of road ends. Um, and it's going to be pretty interesting to see it over the next couple decades. Yeah, so I, I'll just leave this with a thanks. I mean, I obviously we work with people from all kinds of fields doing this kind of work. Uh, and I'll just leave these guys up. But I especially want to highlight my post like Giacomo, who's just been awesome. Nick and Valerie, who was so fun working with those guys. Uh, my old boss, Jake Taylor, and NIST, who really got me, you know, sort of deeply involved in this quantum noise stuff, and then all, all these experimentalists who are doing stuff with us. Um, thank you very much. Yeah, I'd be happy to take any other questions. Yeah, thanks a lot. I mean, yeah, I mean, I think people will, will probably stick around. So maybe you can address uh, Divine's question first, and then we can open up the the floor yeah. to people. Okay, so. So you asked about Catherine Zirk and Eric Verlinde who are doing one thing, which is not this thing. And then there's a bunch of other people doing this thing. So so let me try to unpack it a little bit. So there's a there's a what I would consider a conservative experiment, which is what you asked, which is I want to like take two massive objects and see if I can entangle them through the gravitational interaction. Um, that that is what I'm suggesting is going to be doable. And and the answer to your question is yes, in my opinion, that is a very definitely a test of quantum gravity. It's a test of perturbative quantum gravity at super low energy. So it, it doesn't test UV physics, of course. Um, but I should be able to interpret it as a quote unquote quanta in the sense that I go through the prescription of how I would quantize, um, you know, gravity at some, you know, at, at some heuristic level. And then I would do an experiment and I would conclude that, okay, fine, this is, this is what I interpret as a quote unquote quanta. Um yeah. The way I drew it in I, yes. And the way I'm drawing it here is you can also interpret it and in, actually Rovelli has a nice paper uh spelling it out this way. You you can also interpret those as, as literally superposing the space symmetric perturbatively. So yeah. that, that's what you're really testing. Um so Catherine's thing is sort of different. Um so here's a slide I show sometimes. Uh, <laughs> So they had this proposal, and actually Craig Hogan had basically the same proposal 20 years ago now, um, which is a wild, large violation of effective quantum field theory. So, so the idea, the claim was, so say I take LIGO, and I look at the noise in the distance between the mirrors caused by just gravitational you know, vacuum or whatever. Yep. <clears throat> so if you, if you just take gravity, perturbatively quantize it as an EFT like normal, and calculate this, uh, you get a, the only answer you could have gotten, right? Which is that the the variance in that length is of order of the Planck length uh, squared. Yeah. Uh, now there's some questions about about cutoffs, but okay. Uh, 
this is totally unobservable. This is this will never be observed. The what what these guys had suggested was well maybe because of some scaling law and holography that's not very precisely stated. Maybe the answer is actually a lot bigger. And instead of L Planck squared, you get the geometric mean of L Planck and the baseline, which is now four kilometers uh, coming in here. And then there's some um, coefficient we don't know how to calculate. So if you put in the numbers, um, that is observable. Uh, so if C equals one, this coefficient, then this is actually an uncertainty of 10 to the negative 16 meters, which is much bigger. That's a, that's a wildly visible signal in LIGO. Um, so then you have to say, okay, well, why does this happen? But I didn't see it in LIGO. And then they say, well, maybe this, this C function is a frequency dependent thing and you have to be at a higher frequency or blah, blah, blah. Um, but yeah, I just really want to highlight, like, this is a test of, it's not clear what this is a test of. Yeah. Uh, so that was actually, so, so I've heard this talk multiple times and I was, uh, I, I was never sure what they were trying to measure because, I mean, the idea essentially was that you have some kind of an emergent gravity from holography, and then all of these coefficients would be calculable from some, uh, you know, from some underlying construction of holographic gravity and what have you. And then these numbers would depend on whatever, however you want to construct those models. And but it's not clear to me what what they're measuring really. I mean, uh, these C functions can be anything, and that have, may have nothing to do with, uh, you know, like gravity as we understand it because this is not weak gravity this is this is strong gravity in, in some sense yeah. um so yeah okay anyway yeah anyway that was a that was an offshoot question so you know this is this is yeah you know. <laughs> no it's okay I, I i have thought about this at some length so you know yeah well anyway they are building this thing uh yeah as far as i know they're building this thing yeah <laughs> And actually, as a technical device, it's very beautiful. But uh, what is it testing? To, in my opinion, unclear at, at best. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Sure. Uh, all right. Did anyone else have anything they want to ask before we before we head off? Maybe I, I just have one. I think it's probably just a sort of a re re restatement of the final point you had on your conclusions. There is there's no limit to squeezing. Like there's right. there's no limit to like how much you can squeeze out the uncertainty in in that one variable. There's is there but is there like a well, I guess you're you're making a fundamental statement. Is there like a point of diminishing returns and in, in this sort of stuff practically? In yeah, like it seems like it's going to be hard to get more than about twenty dB of squeezing. That's the sort of current folklore, uh, and that's because at some point you've got to get the squeezed light into a device and there's going to be some loss at the port where you do that. It's like for very benign technical reasons, but yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, all right. So last chance for anyone, I think, yeah, we had a lot of good discussion. So yeah, maybe I'll, uh,